right. Uh, so, hey Joshua, so so Adam met with the people from SBAR. They said they were. We were told that without IP protection, or at least the claim thereof, that they are not likely to fund something. So I was just asking Adam about this. Is that like? Everyone, or just this particular grant reviewer? No, everyone. That um, you don't have to have IP, like a, a patent application filed. You just uh, telling them that we're going to open source this is probably not going to benefit us. And telling them that we I and mean, we don't you don't have to have it filed by phase one, but by phase two, most likely you would need something filed. People I was talking to at, at the uh, Missouri Center for Defense and Energy uh, here, the, the grand the grand guy there, he said he didn't see any problem with the the open source. Mm -hmm. um, In fact, all of the recent SBIRs I've been on have been open source ones. So I, I did one okay. for a scientific firm, and I did another two for Re3D, which is a open source three D printing company. Okay, so maybe this this uh, counselor didn't know what he was talking about. He he had been uh, a reviewer uh, for twelve years for I think NIH. Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe it depends on the agency as well. Yeah, like for example, DoD. I was told they love open source. Okay, and, I, and <laughs> yeah, and there are people that are on side, and so I I think there are definitely more people that are on side than ever before but yeah. it's a it's a risk I guess at least a little bit but the I think in all the ones that I've been successful on we've made it very clear that the business model is benefited by open source so the more people that copy it the more money we make and so as long as you make it clear that you know like following the open source ecology business model like that's what we're doing we're not just making widgets to sell exactly that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, Joshua, you're kind of cutting out. And sorry, we're in the middle yeah. of farm country. <laughs> Looks like Missouri. Yeah. Um, no, I heard you loud and clear, Joshua. You made a claim that, yeah. oh, yeah, it's very clear to the grant making authorities that, oh, if you say that the business model benefits the open source business model benefits sales and yeah that's a plus it's a clear plus i mean it's just economics logic it's like at the end of the day revenue has to be generated and i mean this sensibly it doesn't matter how you're generating revenue in terms of the ip regime as long as you're a successful enterprise i think that's the bottom line can you succeed as an enterprise and for us the case is absolutely that the open source makes it a, a better business model for various ways we can commercial, com so-called commercialize. One, one way to do it is education and, and kits or uh, collaborative further collaborative development on it, training, uh, business incubation on the topic. I mean, training fabricators to now use, work with open source torch tables or uh, open source WAAM machines and stuff like that. So it, we can make a clear case for the economic benefit. Okay. Uh, yeah, and maybe it depends on the agency. He said to reach out to a program manager to to get their take on it. Mm -hmm. So we can... I, I think that's a definitely good idea. If yeah. if the program manager can either knows about it or can be educated to sort of buy in, then then you're okay. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you know they have a lot to say about who, who does the reviewing, and yeah. even if you can nudge them into some people that are at least not antagonistic towards open source, you have a you have an in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe this counselor was uh, used to NIH, where you you need a lot of funding to uh, to get it through like FDA trials, and and so you, you need some IP uh, to protect yourself from from um, what is that called? Uh, someone who would just come in and, and free ride. Right. Uh, right. There's not much of a free rider problem, um, as much in the three D printing space. I, I'd assume. Um, although, you know, looking into uh, RepRap, um, it doesn't seem like Prusa is 
is uh, really open source anymore. So I'm, I'm wondering if that is kind of needing to 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 uh, maintain some some advantage there. Um, that's that's all choice. It's a, they can't make it with an open revenue model. That's that's their deal. Um, for us, it's here we're changing history to but it at the same time. I, I thought. I mean, yeah, but I, I'm fairly confident Prusa is still pretty good. Prusa is still what? The um, some of the other ones have kind of fallen off the wagon slightly, like the uh, you know obviously MakerBot and those guys, but the uh, what is it? The other European one. Um, Maker. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're only quasi open source. They patented a few things, but all the other. So both Prusa and Lulzbot, which are the two top ones in Europe and US, are both open source. And then like the Ender 3 is, and that's, I think that's the most popular sold 3D printer of all time. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a Chinese company open sourcing it. Which, which okay. one is that? Ender? The Ender 3. Ender it's a uh, Creality. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, so they have the, the advantage of the like the Chinese manufacturing and open source building. So they're, they're doing pretty well. Yeah. Okay. And you know, either way, if they force us to do it, uh, where the, we, we say it's going, there's going to be IP, um, we might not actually develop anything that's patentable. So it's, it's really up in the air. I think they just, you know, we, we might have to, you know, say one thing, but, but it's, it's, I don't think we'd be forced to stick with that. We can't say another thing because we're in the public eye. We can't be uh, not true to our brand as far as we're concerned. Okay. Right. And I'm, I'm sort okay. of in the same boat. Like, I've, okay. I've pitched my wagon pretty hard to open source. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, maybe maybe there are other ways to fund this project that we don't need to go with SBIR if that's if that's going to, you know. I think one of the big it. advantages to SBIR, though, is that it's the percent success rate in terms of U.S. granting agencies is much higher. Like, I, you know, I think we're, we have a pretty good chance of getting it, I would think. I don't know, NSF 2016, they were like 15% success rate on a phase one. Yeah, that's, that's still way better than six. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, five. <laughs> and if if you resubmit, you take you take their um, their advice on how to improve your submission. I think the submission is you're more like fifty percent on your second yeah. submission. So uh, yeah, it's pretty yeah pretty good. Um, I yeah, there's it. I, I made a a, a, garbage. a little presentation of um, what I was thinking uh, the project would look like, but um, Marson, you might have other ideas. Maybe the oh, can you paste the link to that one again? Uh, a presentation? Yeah, the presentation that you made. Do, do you have a link for that? Oh, I no, it's just on my computer. I can, um, I could. Can you share what it? I could, I can send it to you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, okay. So. Basically, 3D metal printers are way too expensive. I listed a few here. Even the ones that claim to be uh, not as, expen as expensive, well, they still have uh, debinding, de uh, like cleaning solutions to remove the binder, and then uh, uh, furnaces for sintering. So they end up still being uh, you know, well over $100,000. Uh, and then as far as... CNCs, um, a CNC to machine steel, you're looking at over two hundred thousand um, dollars. There are some CNCs that machine uh, like wood that are five axis. Um, for you know, here's one for forty two thousand. Here's one for seven euro. Um, but yeah, they they wouldn't be able to machine steel. Um, so the idea is, if you were to print. Uh, print with a, a metal like so like a, a MIG then you wouldn't have very much material to remove and uh, therefore you could you could stand to have low feeds and speeds uh, for removing material uh, to, to clean up the welds uh, because the welds are, would be really low resolution with a, a MIG 
So you could clean up those welds with a CNC and you wouldn't have to have as rigid of a machine because you're not removing very much material. And since you're not, uh, you're not having such a rigid machine, then the price of your machine goes down. Um, I'm not the first person to think of this. There's the Ability 3D. I'll show a little video of that. Um, this company, you can see uh, they're, they're printing with a MIG, and right next to it is a, a spindle where they're removing material. Right next to it? Right next to it. And they're both they engaged at the same time? Or do they like pull in, or does, does the... No, so uh, one prints and then the, then it comes back and and machines. Yeah. Okay, are so to, um, are we attached to the version where you have both both items in one, or can we do one that's just wire arc additive manufacturing? But or is that not interesting? Because process well, is interesting. The, yeah. So the the problem with that is um, your welds, uh, any imperfections, any bumps. Uh, they get magnified because the, the the bump it gets closer to the torch head, and so you're uh, you're putting down more uh, material faster where there are bumps and slower where there are, are, are you valleys. Sure because my experience on MIG welding says that if you blast the power up, that that issue goes away. Uh, yeah, you might have a much more accurate MIG than I do. Yeah, but. Uh, but I, I think this is an industry issue. If you, you know, watching Wham um, presentations, that they, they all like industry that does this right now. Wham printing, they say that that's an issue uh, with the, with in, their. In, in general, you're definitely going to get better resolution if you machine it after every pass. Yeah, if if you plane it every pass, um, and then just getting the higher resolution mm -hmm. if you do the the perimeters. Mm -hmm. um, there is another company. Oh, sorry. So one more thing about Ability 3D. They are not, as far as I can tell, manufacturing this at all. They're they're not on the internet other than they had they had presented this at a show. You can't buy their product. Um, yeah. Another company, uh, Big Metal Additive, out of Colorado. Mm -hmm. Show his video real quick. So you can see it's a very large printer. They make very large parts. Uh, here's a couple of their parts you can see. Um, do they mill them too? They do. They machine every layer, just like I'm mm -hmm. proposing. Uh, this this one I think is like uh, six foot by like ten or twelve foot by like six foot. So he can. It, it was. The dimensions were chosen so that he could machine uh, or print a Ferrari chassis, I believe. Anyway, that is not available for purchase. He is um, yeah. apparently making money by by building things for like uh, the Air Force or Department of Defense or something. Are we open so, to the, uh, Adam? I mean, since you you like the machining part, but also the without machining part is good for large things like frames and stuff, like chassis here or tractor frame or things like that. Is that um, would you be interested in that as well? Because if we're developing this, then the former is part of the latter. You'd have you'd have the wham optimization as one part of it, and that in yeah. itself would be good for for a bunch of various things as long as they're large size. Such as yeah. Yeah. I mean that's it, that's all right. Um, the the problem is, at least I wasn't able to get high enough resolution. So once you get a couple layers, um, you start getting these bumps, and then your torch head runs into the bump. And so I wasn't able to to actually three D print very many layers before the torch head would run into the part. Joshua, what's your experience with that? Did you run into this issue? Sorry, the um, issue of, of it's, po it's possible. It's possible. Well, so we were only doing everything things that were a couple inches high, so we didn't have that as a major issue once you dialed in your print settings. But if we wanted it to be perfect, we found that 
after each run, we were like manually cleaning it off with like a bristle brush, just to like tighten it up a little bit. And that's how we got our, our best friends. Uh, um, uh, cleaning up what? Just the like the this matter mess. Of after it. the entire print or after between each layer. layers? It, for ours at least, you need it between layers. And that, the, the, uh, the truth of it is you need several minutes, or like a minute or so between each layer so that you don't continue to build up heat and eventually turn the whole thing into a puddle, depending upon the part size. So for small prints, you need a, a small delay in between each layer anyway. And so you can, can clean it up at that stage. But if we're going to completely automate it for large prints, I think a lot of our thermal issues will go away. Uh, but water it, table it's still definitely good idea to do with your issue. net shape. Josh, a water table solves that. That's standard for torch tables. Right? Uh, the torch only table. trouble with that is that we found you start to change the material properties if you accelerate the cooling too much. Yeah. So there's all kinds of... Yeah, they have a, a big problem with warping. ...things going on mm -hmm. where the cooling rate... Yeah. Yeah, uh, so one more thing to note about this... Big Not to say that can't be done. It's just, it's right. pretty common. Cool. Yeah. Uh, one more thing about this big metal additive. Um, they, they talked about commercializing, making one they could sell two foot by two foot by two foot uh, build volume for $300,000. So still not uh, very good uh, for hobbyists, you know, way out of our price range. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, uh, Lincoln Electric, they have uh, these industrial robots, uh, like five or six axis robot arms that mm -hmm. they, uh, they, they 3D print. Yeah, and they have very high resolution. On the right, you can see a, a picture of a piece of steel that uh, my local Makerspace had uh, a Lincoln Electric printed this for them. And you're, it's probably about three millimeters wide by about two millimeters high. Mm -hmm. You can see the, the very high resolution, but even their, just their MIGs. You and can? So we, we can beat that now. We can definitely beat that with a MIG. Yeah, so we've the best we've done with steel is half oh, a wow. millimeter. And with aluminum, two millimeters, and that, but that's okay. small, small scale. What is I what is your uh, wire size settings? Um, Must be really small. Oh gosh, it is not the smallest you can buy. It's one up. The what we found is that as you decrease the wire diameter, your resolution improves until the wire starts okay. to waggle around, and you. You avoid that waggling a little bit better with steel than you can with. Yeah, aluminum. I didn't even. I, I I did some attempts with aluminum, and it was just garbage, just splatter everywhere. So I yeah, I, yeah. I gave up on that. Aluminum is. Brutal. I guess. So. <laughs> well, even like, yeah, you know, when you're used to plastic 3D printing, and then you go to aluminum, it's like, man, this whole thing. <laughs> it's yeah. Garbage. Uh, so I, I, what I did was, um, I bought this, you know, thousand dollar. Question, Bob's. question. Hold on, yeah, Joshua. yeah. Question for Joshua. Joshua, when you did that, the, the resolution of two millimeters up to down to a half, you're talking about TIG, correct? Joshua, can you hear? I believe Joshua was talking about TIG, uh, with, but that's fine. That's good. They're doing some with smaller, more precise welders, yeah, uh, which wouldn't really apply to larger parts. It would be small scale kind of stuff. Um, but go ahead. I had a question. Another question on uh, Lincoln. What were they using the milling? Uh, no. That's what I'm talking Part about. You milling. can get good stuff, man. It's uh, can you control the control the welder? Uh, or just a high quality welder uh, that you can control the current uh, on that, that does. The last PhD that I put through doing the metal printing. We're all talking about MIG. Yeah, and I MIG. don't talk about MIG. Wow. That's good. Yeah, so MIG. MIG can do pretty good. I, I still think for high resolution, TIG is the way to go, but we haven't proven that yet. We're we're still relatively I mean, early. 0.5 millimeters. Still, and we're trying. But. Yeah. 
0.5 millimeters. I, I, I can't imagine asking for more. <laughs> uh, Joshua, is that PhD available yet, or is this hot off the Sorry. press? Sorry. Is that thesis available, or that's not even published yet? I missed the last. I missed the last event. So the, 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 the stuff about the MIG is all published. The TIG, we're, we're, I don't know, like maybe another month or so we'll have we'll be ready to, to share it. it it's yeah. We're still just doing the optimized the optimization runs. Mm -hmm. That's current work. Okay. Adam, keep going. All right. So uh, some experiments I was doing just in the basement were uh, I bought this CNC, you know, cheap thousand dollars Bob CNC. Uh, it's actually located in Missouri, and mounted this very cheap uh, MIG torch to it. It was actually a, a flux core welder. Uh, oh, my daughter's. I'm, on a, I'm in a meeting. Uh, so I, I changed from flux core to a solid steel wire, um, poked a hole in the nozzle to add some shielding gas. Mm -hmm. uh, it was AC originally put a rectifier on it to make it DC, um, added a solid state relay uh, to turn it off and on, um, changed the, 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 uh, the microcontroller to a, a big tree tech SKR, it's a common 3D printer board, um, and then wrote up a little program that uh, turns the, the SSR, the uh, solid state relay on and off um, to turn the wire feeder on and off and so that's how uh, we can 3D print and uh, here's some results so you can see adding the shielding gas uh, was able to get a much smoother weld but uh, not great resolution and I'm guessing that's because the, the, the motor the wire feed motor wasn't uh, running consistent consistently enough uh, maybe a, a stepper motor feet would, would be better. But I, I went ahead and tried machining just a, a line of the kind of plane. Uh, and you can see it's just got a, a, a cheap Makita router, but it was actually able to, to mill the, the weld. Um, but the, the pulleys and, and stepper motors that move the router around were not strong enough, and so it uh, it it went over to the right and started machining into the the, the build plate. And then I, I tried coming in from the other direction, and it skipped down the the uh, weld and then started machining into the build plate. Um, but the nice thing about it is it it didn't uh, the the bit did not. Uh, did not overheat. If it, it's even with this this cheap uh, setup, it was able to make mm -hmm. this mild steel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think if if we just had stronger stronger motors and maybe a chain instead of these rubber pulleys, it, it would have actually machined it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so piece of cake. We got we got like the universal axis kind of stuff, or you can also use grinders. Which require very even less force. I'm not sure if that's how feasible that is, but grinders, if you talk about using less force and weaker high, weak, weaker axis systems, that would also work. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how long, if a grinder is going to work for a, like a large print. You might end up wearing it down too much or and causing too much heat. I don't know if Joshua has anything to say about that. But. I mean, industrial grinders come in different sizes and shapes. If if you're really going industrial, you're going to need water cooling in any case. Uh, I would suggest water cooling in any case if we're not trying to do something serious in all cases. Or just coolant would be yeah, I guess would be the standard, no? The only, the only uh, nervousness around oh. that is that uh, 
you know, with the welder being there, um, if if you somehow get coolant around that you can um, you, ca you ca can cause a short maybe to to your your motors or your controller you um, to the frame itself so that you know somebody touching the frame you know I'm just so you're talking about more more hobby I'm not scale, sure but I'm not sure if you absolutely need the the cooling uh, I mean, it's a question of performance. Are you designing for hobby performance or industrial performance? I would, I mean, I would start by saying we're going for industrial performance, not hobby. Um, well, what, I mean, at a similar price point. I'm not talking about jacking up the price by 10x. I'm talking about similar performance, but starting with assumptions that we're we're going for industrial productivity on a small scale as opposed to uh, entertainment. <laughs> Yeah, because that's just, the potential of open source. I just don't know. I just don't know that it buys you that much to to do the the cooling, the coolant. Okay. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm not an expert in this area. So it, it just seems if if you can get away with uh, machining, you know, maybe you need to get an, a more expensive bit. Uh, but but it might be possible just to machine without the coolant. Of course it's possible. The question is what performance are we aiming for? That would be a question okay. to, to I mean, start by, with. By yeah. performance, are you saying resolution or speed? Both speed and resolution. Because the, the and nice cost. thing of, yeah, the nice thing about mm -hmm. this is uh, the idea of just 3D printing in metal and as compared to CNC is you're just not removing very much material. So mm -hmm. So if you're not removing much material, you don't have to go all that fast to, to print something. Uh, well, the question is, uh, what what uh, deposition rate are you interested in? If, if that deposition rate is low enough, then yeah, you can absolutely do it. We can. I mean, I, I, I think so. this method is a is going to be a very competitive method for deposition rate. Um, it's it's laying down metal much faster mm -hmm. than like a a powder laser. Oh yeah, metal. Oh yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, I think that's details like that. It's not a big issue to put in a so, to put in enough structure to to do the milling as necessary. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, that's not a, not a problem. Right, and, and maybe maybe you don't need to mill the entire part. Only the places that need to be high high resolution. Um, if if we can get a, a welder to to print welds. With a high enough resolution, uh, so the, anyway, the the phase one, um, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, I think just making some uh, welder that can at a torch head that can attach to any CNC or you know, kind of universally to to CNC right to the spindle, uh, that would be nice. I think making our, or our using off the shelf. Position, Sorry, would we? Are you suggesting making the welder part or uh, doing an open, uh, doing an off-the-shelf welder option? I think an off-the-shelf. Well, so you need to modify the welder um, to turn on and off the the feed, the the wire feed, um, and to get the 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 high resolution. I'm guessing you'll need to to change out the the DC motor on the uh, for the wire feeder to a step motor. In that case, hmm. um, we would probably need to sell them the welder as well. Yeah, that's great. Open source welder is one of our 50 tools, and it's about time. Yeah. Um, so the the attachment, can, you know, some, if somebody wants to to convert their uh, a CNC that they already own into one of these, they can just attach their torch, this torch head to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we will need to we have a, a different microcontroller um, so that they can run 3D printing software on that CNC. Right? They, they're not going to be able to use 
you know, their, their regular CNC software uh, for 3D print. Uh, here's the, just one more thing. You, you can't do it with any gantry. You, the, the big deal here, if you're going to do anything, is the spatter and heat protection. So you're going to have to have a shroud custom chamber to, to take the heat. I don't see this going on when you just slap this welder onto any machine. You yeah, know, I could do, do that. For I'm doing it with a wooden, a wooden machine. I know, but but that's for that's for entertainment. If you talk about performance, you would be you would need a little more than that. I mean, you're talking about uh, stuff stuff like with welders. Yeah. I mean, I, I I work with welders quite a bit. I mean, you're gonna need that if you're gonna get any you know anything that has any performance to it. Yeah, but I I think that's kind of minor. You could probably just glue some aluminum foil to it and it's it's going to keep it's going to withstand the the sparks oh, maybe maybe that'll be innovation because uh, I I would definitely if I were doing this I would not start with anything that's off the shelf I would start from scratch because it's gonna be easier and cheaper but if people already have one then they can go through the effort yeah. to convert it and won't work as well but it could be acceptable yeah that would yeah, be innovations I, we'll call I, it innovation I, 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 yeah, so my point is that um, I'd like to narrow our value proposition. Yeah. Um, get really good at, at one thing. And yeah. Okay. The one thing that you need to be good at. Um, we don't necessarily need to be good okay. at uh, making these CNCs. There are probably hundreds of, of CNC kits out there. And it mm -hmm. would be nice to give people the option to use the whatever kit they want to, to attach uh, what we have. Yeah. For phase one. Yep, that's a, that's a, that's a focus indeed. Yeah. So for phase one, that's, that's how it is. We, you know, we're basically turning it into a 3D printer. The nice thing about um, being a 3D printer, there's already mm -hmm. this built software slicers. The, the software um, I've been working with is Cura. The nice thing yep. about Cura is that they have oh, an yeah. ironing function that um, can be used to as a. Uh, it, it already has. Um, it, it's basically planing, so mm. um, we don't have to change the software to to add the planing feature. Um, then, nice. Okay. And then to do perimeters, they have a feature where you can do multiple nozzles, and as long as hold on a sec, I got a question. Yeah, planing that they're already set up for attachment of of mills. No, it's it's what what's called ironing. So you can bring okay. your nozzle down and, oh, and iron I the, the surface <laughs> to make okay. it smoother. I see. Um, huh. So instead of using it to make it smoother, well, we are making it smoother. But we're using uh, not the you know extruder head, but the yeah. The end mill. So anyway, um, yeah. the other feature that's nice with Kira is that you can do a multiple nozzle where one nozzle does perimeters and one nozzle does the infill. Well, in yeah. this case, our infill is the weld and the perimeters are the the end mill. Uh huh. So yeah. so no yeah. software changes need to be made mm. in oh good in the the slicer settings. Mm hmm. Just and if we add a stepper to the the wire feed for the welder, then mm -hmm. you don't have to even have any software changes to to tell to go on and off. It's just going to treat it like a regular filament extruder. Yeah. So so as far as programming, this basically requires zero programming. Um, although I did notice that Cura doesn't allow you to go over a certain nozzle size, which is important because I don't think you want to go much smaller than like an eighth of an inch uh, end mill, just because planing a large part is going to take forever. Um, oh, I see, I see. Yeah. It allows you max of three millimeter nozzle? Uh, I don't think it even allows that big. But uh, let's see. Cure is open source, so that could be readily modified in a code, exactly. right? Exactly. It should be. It should be easy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then that's phase one. I think that's a pretty yeah. good sellable product in itself. And yeah, you, you know, I'm I'm willing to pitch in some money to to get it 
get it done um, if yeah. I if I was confident that I could make that money back, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, as far as phase two, this is where where things get more expensive. Um, I want to be able to 3D print tapers and overhangs, right? And that, that 3D printer um, phase one is not going to be able to do that. You need to, Why not? You need to angle your welds. Uh, on an overhang, you might miss where you've been welding and go all the way to the base plate. So you need to angle towards the part. And then uh -huh. likewise with the CNC, if you're machining the perimeters, um, you need to. You, so it, you could probably do tapers um, like this, but you would have a stepped edge. If you could angle your your end mill, then you wouldn't have as much of a stepped edge. It could be a smooth edge. Uh, uh -huh. Also, um, you're not you know you want to have smooth edge for an overhang. So you need to be able to angle your your mill and your your welder. Uh, what would be ideal is to have some attachment like phase one, where you could just attach this to a, any CNC, where it would uh, rotate the spindle and in uh, in all directions. But um, I, I kind of what about that. using different profile mill 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 bits? That gets you the tapers. Yeah, well, it gets you it gets you tapers so you can go tapered um, this way, but not it wouldn't get you overhangs. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So if you want yeah. overhangs, we need we need to be able to to go at an angle. Yeah. So the yeah. idea for that one uh, is more like the. Uh, um, let me. I don't have a very good drawing of this. Um, the idea for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll show yeah. you. Sure. Am I sure. presenting? Am I? Am I presenting uh, my Google Drive now, or do I need you're, to? You're doing. So you're you're a, doing a, just a. What's this software? What's this software? What was that software? What was that software? Okay, I'll I'll switch. Um, let me present the. Does it look like we? Does it look Joshua? like we lost Joshua? Yeah, I think so. Perfect, because he can watch, Perfect, back, on he can watch back on the videotape. Okay. Um, let me present a tab. Uh, Is this nasty noise, this nasty noise of me chewing on some food speaker? coming through the speaker? Uh, I can hear it. Badly? It's all right, then. Badly? I, no, I mean it's, it's not bothering me. So the idea is something like Wait, this. Is where, Wait, is that yours? Yeah. Oh, cool. So this was oh, the cool. this was the original. Um, before I gave up on this because so this was kind of um, designed off of the mostly printed CNCs, so MP CNC. Right. right. Uh, but I found that th these three D printed parts were not rigid enough. Um, that and the tubes, I think, just at these large scales. Uh, the tubes are not rigid enough. You really need um, what, what's called a torsion box. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, the idea would be that the, the entire x-axis can rotate. And um, then you would have, you might have two of these, actually, to make it more rigid. Uh, but instead of tubes, it would be uh, like a piece of wood, like a uh, two by six or something. Um, or maybe not that thick. I don't know. But anyway, uh, then your your spindle could rotate um, around the other axis um, so that you get all five axes. Um, and then for a Z, the Z you could actually you could either have the whole base plate move up and down in the Z direction, or um, or you could put a motor. Uh, like a z-axis mounted to uh, the thing rotating here. Um, this would be like a large. There'd be a large gear uh, that that you would mount the the spindle and welder to, and then uh, 
and and then they, there would be there would definitely be as little z axis because at that point you would need to mount the the welder and the the spindle separately because as you rotate around the the welder might run into the part or vice versa so um, you know you would have like a warm gear to, so that um, so that the gear would stay in place um, So that that is what I was thinking. If if the other the other design is uh, not rigid enough, mm -hmm. and and basically, uh, let me show you the uh, so the design I'm talking about is. So like uh, build your own CNC, they make one called the uh, Blackfoot. Mm -hmm. It's uh, four foot by eight foot, um, and it's got that roller chain I was talking about. Pretty large. I think it's fairly rigid. You could maybe put two of these X axes. But yeah, this this plate that the Z axis is mounted on, and that would actually be on some type of like lazy Susan gear so that it, it could rotate and you could you know uh, I don't know what what angle is that called uh, are they using like on Blackfoot they're using chain plus stepper yes what resolution do they get I don't know I mean, a chain should not have any play in it, so it's probably as good as the stepper, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if they have issues with backlash, and it, it probably depends on your uh, your gear ratios. But uh, fairly inexpensive compared to, like, uh, uh, threaded rod. So, have you seen our universal access system? I I did. It was kind of like the MPCNC type thing, right? Not at all. No. Okay. Maybe it. Maybe I didn't. No, it's just a simple uh, stepper carriage idler base kind of axis. What what you're talking about? All the mechanical we can do in a piece of cake, like. We're building one inch ver rod versions of that solid rod. So for four by four, you can get, I don't have numbers for you, but, but we can get any kind of a, a structure that we need because you ca we can do larger rod size. So we are actually talking, like if you talk about two by two, uh, I, I looked, looked at numbers for two by two or something to that effect for a heavy duty milling machine, half a micron, Half a thou, sorry, half a thou deflection with 200 pound force. So that's the kind of stuff we can do in a second for lowest cost you can imagine. Wow. Um, this is th like uh, all welded joints or what? No, how, this how is the three. Look at the. <laughs> no, this is the simplest thing in the world. This is called the universal axis and it's 3D printed pieces and metal rods. So you can think of metal plastic composites. But let me send you the. Universal. I thought you did upload it to my uh, my Google Drive. Universal Access comes with sizes enough for 3D printers, torch tables, and heavy-duty milling machines. So take a look at... Uh... Wait, where are you? Did I lose you? No, I'm here. Wait, where, where am I? Where's your... Oh, oh wait, there it is. No. There. Um, so there's the chat. I mean, look at the Universal Access page. So that's it. What, what would be of interest here for this application would be probably one um, 1.5 or 2 inch rod size. And we can do this readily with low cost 3D prints. Okay, so um, your frame is, is made out of rods. They're, they're uh, solid. Separate. So frame is separate. Frame is, let me show you what we do for frames. Okay. Um, uh, I would suggest, if we're doing a frame at this scale, um, 
I would do, so we're building four by four by eight foot 3D printers uh, October the 1st. And the frame we're gonna use there is going to be flats. Sorry, it's actually gonna be four by four by quarter angle held in place by 3D print printed plastic pieces to the point that we can weld it up. Basically lay up using 3D printed assist corner connectors mm -hmm. and then you've got a 4x4x4 four by four by four frame that's kind of self-aligned with the 3D prints and then you weld, the, weld it off at the end. Um, okay. Uh, but let's see, universal frame. So this is what we do for frames. We've, we've experienced everything from few inches to 20 foot frames so do far. Do you want to present? Uh, sure, here's the link that <clears throat> I sent you. So let me get on a box here. <laughs> uh, my screen, uh, can't sh your browser can't share your screen. That's great. Uh, why not? Oh, how about now? Why can't I share my screen? Oh, um... Your browser can't share your screen. How about I try another? Let me see if I go to Firefox if it works any better. Okay. Have you looked into using Unistrut at all? Using what? Using what? You use uh, for your frame. frame. It's available so at you know like Lowe's and Home Depot. No, we make, no, we make our own. Um, um, hold on. Hold on. Uh, I, mean, I don't think, I don't think this is letting me share my screen anyway. anyway. Forget it. Okay. Uh, no, you start, you make, so if you go to the D3D frame and it talks about the universal frame system, we've done everything from Unistrut. Our Unistrut, which is the tractors and iron workers with 150 ton force levels on it, to tiny ones for 3D printers. So if you go through that frame, those are the types of frames we, we did. I would readily do, if we're talking about our thing, uh, quarter by four by four angle. That's the most cheapest structure you can get for that kind of level. It could even be quarter by two by two if you're depending on what scale you'd like. If you'd want to do like two by two feet, quarter by two would be fine. Uh, quarter by four for the four by four by eight foot tall kind of a scale um, but you can uh, yeah and then for like much larger things which is probably not re well this is actually relevant for this is the truss frames rebar truss frames like you see in that picture you prototype those they work extremely well they're the lowest cost structure Here, I'll, we'll go ahead and present so you can me no I'll, I'll go ahead and present the frame uh, you can talk about it. Okay. So. Yeah, go ahead. So um, go up. So that's on a 20, 20 by 20 foot grid, that Facebook post. Yeah. Those are trusses that with 1,100 feet to deflect a quarter inch. One, one, sorry, with 1,100 pounds hanging on the middle, they deflect a quarter inch. So that's like the larger scale structures for workshops or larger scale gantries. Like if you want to hang a large wham system that mm -hmm. prints an entire chassis, this is what you want to use. Okay, scroll down. If you want to go uh, to these, this is how we used to do small frames, CNC cut six sides and weld them together. That's robust, but it requires CNC, go down. Uh, we use this uni strut, which is quarter by four by four, or half by four by four angle for things like frames and tractors and iron worker machines that work with loads on the order of 150 tons. Scroll down. Let's scroll down. That was the iron worker. Here's the 3D printed corners, which work really well with angle. That's like if you want to do a 3D printed corner for a small machine, even with like quarter by four by four, you can probably do a very robust frame. Actually, I would, I might even suggest that quarter by four by four angle at the level of four by four by four working, or or. Uh, cubic volume, 100% infill on the corners will get you to a super solid frame on that. Now that's going to be an expect. well the corners are going to be, you need like 
a spool twenty bucks per corner. Mm -hmm. That's which is not that's just using regular filament. Uh, but yeah, these are the small things we used to do. We still do it. Uh, keep going down. Uh, that's CNC files for that. Keep going down. Um, keep going down. That's it. That's all we got. Um, okay. But if we do the hybrid, like the tough thing about making an angle frame is holding the things aligned when you're at the layup phase. So the 3D printed corners actually make that trivial. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see that. Okay. Um, so yeah, I don't know if it's if we want to go for the SBIR, I can go ahead and, and reach out to the program manager, see what their thoughts on open source. Uh, yeah, doc, like model. use the language where it's like the revenue model is. Yeah, I, I mean, I can help on that. But basically, you're making a case. So what's the what's the revenue model on that? And the revenue model would be what are we doing? Kits. Kits. Yeah. Perfectly consistent. The, the open source is actually a great attribute for a kit model because then everyone finds out about you and studies your your pictures and data and and experiments and builds and they say where do I buy one so that's I mean there's I don't yeah. see any issue with that kind of a thing and then we're talking about an edge for us it would be an education model where we also train people to build things like industrial education or even just DIY kind of education, like we run the workshops currently, completely fits in that model as well. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing would be if we could manufacture uh, other things for people with the the 3D printer, uh, kind of like the, that's where the open yeah. source model really shines. We, yeah. we create a whole repo for that for open source design as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't do that in a proprietary way. It's like, you can, but I think the open source model works better for that. OK, I'll, I'll reach out to the, the program manager. And um, we can have an, another discussion about uh, just OCE and, or OSE in, in general um, about some of the other grants that, that we might look at and uh, other organizations we could, we could talk to. That sounds great. Um, if if we do the the wham, can you write it? Yeah, I, I think I I think so. And um, we've got three grant writing specialists, so I know them. Access to like more. Yeah, I have access to. I I I had lunch with them Wednesday. So you they can work with you, but the in terms of. Just public access to them. They got only a limited amount of time. No, they're act, they're open to all the public. So yeah, so it's kind of first come first serve. If they run out, then there's also um, a grant that just became available called the Fast Grant, and September first they get funding for these micro grants from that, uh, about like twenty five hundred dollars each for uh, grant writers. Uh, private grant writers, so uh, you have to get your grant writer approved, but they'll give you $2,500 to uh, for you to spend on a private grant writer. What's the application process for that look like? Uh, you have to go to a, a, a class, like a workshop. I think it's a two-day workshop, and if they think that your, your uh, business makes sense, uh, and you'll th then they'll they'll fund it. They've only got like forty enough for forty grants though. So when it it's uh, first come first serve, and it's not available yet. September first is when they get the money. When is the workshop? When is what's the process? I don't know that they've scheduled it yet because they still haven't gotten the money. But uh, I'll say, find out. When you say first come first serve for the grant writing assistance, is that through cycles, or is the cycle coming happening right now, or no? So the the grant write, writing assistance is it's available all the time. It's just whether or not they have time to help you. Is this on a website somewhere? Because I still haven't been able to see. Uh, they you, they don't really. I, I've looked. They don't really say it anywhere that that like what level of support they offer for grant writing for SBIR. But I talked to the director for Missouri, and he said 
they they do have free grant writing support. So does that mean, what, what does that look like in practice? So I would meet with them and basically transfer the critical knowledge and they would go through filling out the grant or would I have to do a lot of the, the writing myself? Uh, it, it's probably a decent amount of the writing yourself uh, because you, a lot of it, they just don't know enough about the subject to write it. You know, um, and you, if, if you're transferring the knowledge to them, you might as well put it down on paper in the application. Okay. But, but you know, I... know but kind of like, they don't really publish it. I mean, so if I want, so how do I do that? Like, I go call them up or go and step into the office or what? Uh, yeah, you, you can um, call the Small Business Development Center that's local to you, so... Uh, and what I do I ask for? Do I ask for, I would like to set up an appointment with somebody who offers technical grant writing for SBIRs assistance? Yes, yeah. Okay. And th they do more than that, you know, they'll help you uh, register your business, um, give advice on uh, your business model, um, help you get connections, uh, yeah. Like is they've got legal legal clinics. <clears throat> Does the, is the way that works? Is it largely as a consultant role, or where they actually do the work? Yeah, it seems like more consultant. Okay. So, for example, but, you go ahead. Well, but you know, they they might help you find a, a grant to to file for. They they'll help you find government contracts. Um, and set up the connection for you to, to do work for the government, for instance. And how is that different from if they give the, if, they, if you get the 2,500 grant writing um, grant, that's where you would actually pay somebody to do the heavy work for you or still more like yeah. a consultant level? I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, it, probably those private grant writers, they all offer maybe different levels of expertise in each area so you know you're you're having to answer questions that they would have to answer questions that only you know so they can't just write it for you right yeah um, all right I, so, I I kinda... but they might still be like more like a counselor you know okay all right so next step, but so, I, okay. yeah, but I, I can, you know, I think I know enough about the project to, to get it to a decent start. Um, the one thing would be we would need to set up an LLC. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know we don't we don't know each other well, but um, I'm fine with uh, you know setting one up with you to go after this SBIR. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Okay. Yep. Well, then I will. Uh, I'll look into that as well. Okay. So, what are our next steps now? Yeah, I'm going to reach out to the program manager. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking NSF, um, but there's also some 3D printing uh, funding through the Air Force um, and Air the Force. Army. Can you try so, Air Force? Can you and actually, the Air Force is kind of nice. They have companies that they pay to take you through the process. Um, of the SBIR? Of the SBIR. Ah. Yeah, so um, I can reach out to them as well. And Please do. Like, I heard um, better things about Air Force than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they. I, I looked at recent grants, and they've, they've actually had a decent number of 3D printing technologies as, uh, granted, so... And I, I think they offer a lot of help. The nice thing about the NSF is they uh, they have a short form that you can fi uh, fill out, and oh. it, it's not yeah, it's it's quick. They get you uh, uh, feedback within three weeks, so mm. you know maybe I'll reach 